Thank you, Aswin. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. As many of you, if not all, might know that Fountain House Gallery was found in 2000. Yes, dedicated solely to exhibiting works of artists living with mental illness. And for those of you who haven't been able to visit Fountain House Gallery in person, today we have brought the gallery to you. Yes, indeed, this is a 3D replica with all the works of art on the walls, which have been hand selected and curated by Patterson Jim, a good friend of mine, Aggie, who is also the president of Leon Poxmick's foundation and the managing director of Sol Steinberg Foundation. The floor is your Patterson. Take it away. Hi, my name is Patterson Sims, and thank you so much, Fong, for being introduced by you for this wonderful and important event. I was very flattered when Fountain House asked me to be a juror for the show. I've worked with Fountain House a couple times before, and it's such an impressive organization that does such good work. At the core of that work for me is the work of the artists who are associated with this program and how those artists have really, in some cases, become artists as a result of the program, and in other cases, simply confirmed their creativity through what they do. But what was wonderful in looking at the 39 artists who submitted work for this was that A, I felt really strongly that everybody should be represented by at least one work. The space allowed a couple of the artists, or a number of the artists actually, to be able to get two works. And that was great because you could see something of their range. There wasn't really a theme that I was mindful for because it's, this is the work of really individuals and in very strong and um, very determined individuals who have their own distinct sensibilities, unfettered, I would say, by a lot of what makes the art world at the present moment, sometimes more monetary than aesthetic, and sometimes more about careers than really the notion that these are expressions that need to get made and are getting made. So it's the intensity of these works and the sort of honesty of them that really impressed me and impresses me in terms of this program. As I, you know, have done a lot of curatorial work over the years, because I've worked at a number of different museums and had a chance to even work on things like the biennial at the Whitney Museum, which is done every two years. And it's fascinating to see how much of, of your time is reflected in, in the works of art at that time. But in this case, it's so much more about how much of the individual character of these artists is expressed in their works. And so it's a wonderful opportunity to support Fountain House and then these artists as individuals and to know that what they've done has reached out to you and been important enough to you to like certainly look at it carefully and maybe even take it home. I hope you enjoyed the tour with Patterson. Again, all of these original works of art made by Fountain House Gallery artists are made available online in our art auction which is available at the link below. Please check them out throughout the event. But for now, I would like very much to introduce you to this year's speakers who will be discussing creativity, mental illness, and art as essential activism. Kate Redfield Jemison, PhD, is the Dalio Professor in Mood Disorders and Professor of Psychiatry at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. She is the co-author of Standard Medical Text on Bipolar Disorder. Kay is the author of national bestsellers, including Unquiet Mind, which chronicles her experience of living with bipolar disorder and touch with fire, manic depressive illness, and the autistic temperament. Lise Rexer is a member of the MFA faculty at the School of Visual Arts a writer, critic, curator, and a frequent contributor to the Brooklyn Rail. Lai is the author of several critical volumes, including The Critical Eye, 15 Pictures to Understand Photography, How to Look at out, Outsider Art, and with Jonathan Lerman, they also published Drawing by an Artist with Autism. Isa Ibrahim and Susan Sprank Gunberg, a longtime member artist of Fountain House Gallery. Yes, much of Isa's work infused the blow brow with the Eurodite, exposing the truth behind the fairy tale, what he calls a fun house reflection on a bankrupt culture. 
What a poetic description. Susan's work, on the other hand, is autobiographical, commenting on her experience in the mental health system, as well as touching upon other relevant social and political issues. Please join me to welcome Kay, Lyle, Isa, and Susan. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's wonderful to be at Fountain House again, however virtually. It's such a wonderful group and you do such fabulous things. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about a little bit about what we know about the relationship between mental illness and uh, artistic creativity. Uh, it seems counterintuitive that you would have a link between something that is extraordinary and uh, requiring a such great mental and emotional faculties as, as the arts and have that in any way linked to mental illness. But it's, a, it's an observation that goes back thousands of years. Uh, and in fact, has been backed up with a lot of uh, research as, as I'll get to in a minute. Um, I want to make a, a very strong caveat uh, that I don't want to romanticize bad illnesses. I have bipolar illness. I've had it since I was 17. Uh, a suicidal form of it, a psychotic form of it. It runs in my family. I've treated it and studied it for, for decades. And um, many of my friends and colleagues have died of, of uh, bipolar illness and depression. But it is also, uh, these are interesting illnesses because they are kind of an exception in mental illness to where there's a certain at times in some people, a certain advantage. So clearly most people who have uh, mental illness do, are not unusually creative. And most people who are unusually creative don't have mental illness. But there is, um, I think quite well established now, a very much disproportionate rate, particularly of bipolar illness in highly creative people. So let me just talk a little bit about what we know about how you, try and study something as uh, complex and, and, and fabulous as, as the arts, and as complex as mental illness, um, how do you try and study something in an objective way? Um, and the answer is it's hard, as you might imagine. Um, but we ha I wanna just go through a couple of things. One is I wanna give a little bit of the evidence that we have that there's a relationship, uh, particularly between uh, mood disorders and creativity. Uh, and then talk about possible reasons why that is. If why, why should there be, why might there be a relationship between mental illness and uh, creativity? And then I want to talk about some of the treatment implications that, that come as a result. So in terms of evidence, you can, you can do what people did for centuries, which is study individual lives, which are interesting and you can see uh, do people have a disproportionate rate? If you take a group of artists and writers, do they have a disproportionate rate over what we know to be the, the general rate in the public? Um, and you can study those lives. And as, as I said, it's interesting. It's not necessarily uh, terribly scientific or uh, conclusive, but it's, it's very interesting in its own right. Then you can do studies of, of living writers and artists or uh, large groups of people who have... Uh, been studied to to look at their diagnostic uh, the diagnostic patterns and uh, what people it, it, when they come in and for a study and you uh, diagnose them do they have a disproportionate rate of mood disorders have they been treated disproportionately for mania or depression or anxiety um, so that's a second a very large group of studies and then there are more recently in the last ten years or so there have been a series of studies. Um, that are really very, very large population studies uh, ranging from 70,000 people to studying like 1.2 1, 1. million people in terms of uh, the relationship between uh, occupational st uh, studies of, of creativity and uh, hospitalization for mania and depression. So these are huge studies, I mean, very big studies. And uh, what we have found out as a result of that is that um, there's a consistently, uh, with a few exceptions, but strikingly consistently, there's an increased rate of, de of depression, but particularly bipolar illness in people who are highly creative. Uh, and this is true in science and business, but particularly in the arts. 
and across the arts, particularly in poets, but also uh, in, in visual artists and also in musicians. So we know that there's an increased rate um, of mood disorders across these studies. There's also a very much increased rate of suicide um, in these uh, populations, uh, which is obviously deeply concerning. Um, a recent study of meta-analysis, meta which just basically means you're studying a group of studies uh, to see what the outcome is across a large number of studies. There's a recent study of 150 studies looking at mood disorders and creativity, uh, which is a huge number of studies of anything. And what was found in that is that there's an increased rate of bipolar illness in people who are very creative, and there's an increased rate of creativity in people with bipolar illness. Um, and you know, you, you could ask yourself, uh, why, why would there be this level of relationship? And I think there are a lot of reasons. One is changes in thinking. So that, for example, in poets, uh, whom I've said uh, quite a bit, particularly Robert Lowell, um, in, in poets, there's a uh, increased fluency of thinking that's very characteristic of mania of early mania, of uh, increased number of associations, uh, uh, unusual and original associations. Uh, so there's a sort of a fluid thinking, uh, elevated mood that goes along with very fluid thinking. And these have been studied in all sorts of studies, psychological studies as well as studies in people with mental illness. Um, there's disinhibition, which is probably terribly important in the same way that sometimes alcohol can disinhibit people in terms of what they write, in terms of what they paint, in terms of what they compose. Mm. Um, but mania is the ultimate um, uh, uh, disinhibitor. There's also risk-taking and certain fearlessness that are well associated with mania and grandiosity, expans expansiveness, or so tendency to really hit for the fences, aim for the fences. Um, there's uh, painting on, as it were, on a very, very large campus canvas. And then finally, in terms of treatment implications, um, I think it's important to say, I mean, you get asked, well, if you treat my illness, will my creativity go away? And the answer to that is the studies that we have indicate no. Um, one reason is these are very deadly diseases and they're very debilitating diseases. Um, they're also, in the case of bipolar illness, progressive, which means that it gets worse over time. Um, so that's something you have to take into consideration. And we know that lithium, for example, is very uh, good at preventing suicide. Um, and this is a very high risk group uh, for suicide. And lithium also has neuroprotective effects. So certain has t tendency to be able to generate uh, uh, and repair uh, damage uh, done. So. I think in this day and age, we have a lot of options. And um, the important thing is to have a really good relationship with your doctor and therapist um, so that you can, um, under supervision, um, experiment around and, and change things, but to be uh, open to the possibility that, um, you know, A, you're going to have to almost certainly, if you've got bipolar disorder, you're almost certainly going to have to be on meds, but you also almost certainly can keep at a much lower le level than you used to be able to. So, thank you. I want to thank uh, Kay Redfield Jamison, uh, particularly for her work, which for me has been not only uh, tremendously insightful, but also in inspirational for, for the concerns that I've had for the last 30 years as a critic and a, and a curator. And, and, and that subject is uh, outsider art, which is the production of art by people who basically lie or, or, or who work outside the art world. Uh, and in many cases are people who are dealing with serious mental illness and are often, um, or are often incarcerated. Those two things can go together. I wanna take a kind of long view here um, and, and start sort of go as far back as we can to start. Um, I'm very interested in the idea of art that's made without permission. That is art that comes from outside the art world that doesn't require a sanction. And uh, again, we've been, human beings have been doing this for 30 millennia at least. That's 
and we probably will go back the more more we investigate the further we go back human beings have been making uh remarkable images of incredible fidelity and quality for at least that long and they've been doing it all over the world uh most of this art that is the art that's made without permission that is outside professional spheres or outside yeah. very often outside religious uh institutions has disappeared and we'll never see it but some of that work has survived, and as we know more and as we appreciate more, more and more of it is being preserved, and as with Fountain House, it's being encouraged. One of my uh, most remarkable encounters with this work was uh, with a, an artist whose name was unknown at the time when, when I first saw, saw the drawings. It was a man named James Edward Deeds, who was uh, in an institution in Missouri for nearly 40 years for a variety of really difficult situations that he encountered. He was, he was put in by his family, his father in particular. And while he was in the institution, began to make drawings. Uh, they were remarkable drawings and they only come to us because they were by pure happenstance, they were preserved from the trash. Uh, they, were, they were kept for uh, several decades. And when they finally began to emerge, we knew nothing about deeds. And it was the uh, investigations and the help of relatives who came forward, which allowed us to understand not only the source of his imagery, which is re really remarkable, but also the challenges that he faced uh, as an individual and as a creative person. Uh, Deeds is a kind of model, in a way, for an outsider. That is, someone who was completely isolated in his creative activity, who drew on a variety of different sources, and who did it without any expectation that the work would ultimately be seen by others. Uh, that kind of prototype is something we became familiar with, or at least Western society became more familiar with in the 19th century. At the end of the 19th century, it was primarily artists themselves and physicians who became interested in work that was being done by people who were not trained as artists. And that work was, being, was acknowledged for two reasons, I think. First, by the artists, because the artists themselves were at that moment breaking down categories of representation. They were changing the way art was done. Modern art was essentially coming into being and the artists recognized as they were breaking down categories that work that was produced outside the realm in which they knew, the, work, the, the realm of galleries, the realm of critics, the realm of art schools, and the realm of professional activity was often breaking the same barriers that they were attempting to, to overcome. At the same time, Physicians were becoming more and more sophisticated and their conception of the human mind and of creativity itself was also expanding. And we have some visionary physicians and psychologists who were intensely interested in not only the creative process, but the actual outcome itself. And we're interested in collecting the work, we're interested in valuing the work and actually writing critically about that work. It was really that great moment where the notion of outsider art was really born. And it continues to be, I think, furthered by exactly those two groups. Even as the, the world more broadly has become more, more receptive to outsider art, not only acceptive, but, uh, but has embraced it, it's been, nevertheless, it's been physicians and artists themselves who have, uh, I think, have expanded our, our valuation of this work. Um, it was, for example, a psychologist, a man named Carmel Pasto, who working at an institution in California, identified Martin Ramirez as one of the great producers of so-called outsider art. Uh, in the 1950s, Pasto, who was giving classes at the institution in California, recognized Ramirez's his remarkable capabilities, helped collect the work and preserve it at a time when it was often the case in institutions that work was destroyed. It was seen as part of a pathology itself and was often not preserved. Um, this was before or in the early days of, you might say, let's call them art therapy programs. And now Martina Ramirez is regarded as one of the great Mexican artists. He's kind of in the pantheon with people like Frida Kahlo. Uh, again, when his work was discovered, he was considered to be an outsider. He was considered to be sui generis, um, his work un incomprehensible to many. But over time, with acceptance and critical attention, we understand a lot more about the sources of Ramirez's art. We understand who he was communicating with 
that is who he thought his audience with. And not only that, we understand his imagery. And Ramirez is, again, a kind of a model for the outsider, the ultimate outsider, someone who is diagnosed with a, a, a number of, uh, of uh, mental infirmities, including schizophrenia. He, Ramirez's his example extends, in a sense, as a type to many other artists who worked in isolation or have worked with, with psychological uh, challenges in their life. Probably by now, one of the best known is Henry Darger, who lived, he was quite reclusive. He was a janitor. He lived in Chicago and he never told anybody about the work that he was doing. He worked on his own in his apartment and essentially was a novelist, uh, an incredible graphic designer. And more profoundly, he was an artist who was locked in a kind of discussion with God about the nature of justice and sexuality and about good and evil. And over the space of his life, over a number of decades until his death, he worked in solitary on an epic that would detail the, um, uh, the tribulations uh, of a group of young girls in a world in which everything was arraigned against them. And working out that kind of argument with, with the deity, with, with the conditions of the world around them, I think is one of the things we have to pay enormous attention to in terms of the produ production of people who do the work not because they're being paid to do it, not because they've been socialized into it, and not because they've gone to art school and understand necessarily the value to others of their work. Mm. But underneath it, they do it because they have a compulsion and they have a vision that they are attempting to communicate to whoever might find it, whether it's no one or whether it's someone or whether it's only a few. Uh, this, um, this model of the outsider is one that we become very familiar with, again, because the outsiders have over time, through programs like Fountain House, which is enormously important, through many others like the Guggen Institute in, uh, in Austria, have brought, been brought into a mainstream. They brought in into uh, a world in which artists, individuals, collectors, ordinary people can begin to respond to work that's made by others that are often like them. And this bringing the outsiders in, this, how can we put this? This, it's not a normalization of the work, but it is a valuation of the work. It indicates to me a profound and really important shift, not only in the way we look at creativity, not only in the way we value art, it's a process that's been ongoing for at least 150, almost 200 years, this changing in a, on an idea uh, about who gets to make work and who gets to value work, but also it's a change, I think, in the way we begin to look at uh, the human person. And this is where I think it, the, the very presence of outsider art, the very valuation of outsider art, the distribution of it, the promotion of it, uh, as it becomes part of the mainstream, we begin to look at it not as outsider art at all, but as part of a continuum of creativity. And that's how, I, that, that's how I like to see it. That's how the artists have themselves taught me to see it. And that in itself, I think the promotion of that idea is one of the most powerful forms of advocacy that in the art world that we can see today. Uh, it's uh, transformed my life as it transforms, I think, the lives of many people who encounter the work. And I think uh, Fountain House is uh, enormously important. That's why I've been so pleased to be able to do this. Uh, and, and to share some time with, with uh, Kay Redfield Jameson, who's been so important in our appreciation of what human beings can accomplish. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle. That was a very enlightening overview uh, and very uh, inspirational. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Jameson, whose copy of uh, An Unquiet Mind I acquired while I was an inpatient in Creedmoor. And uh, it inspired me to write my memoir, The Hospital Always Wins. So that was a tremendous inspiration for me to find that book. Um, some 30 years ago, upon getting sick with mental illness and, and being diagnosed with schizophrenia, I started purging all that I took in from the media. Um, as an American child raised by television, it was painful and kind of cleansing to release myself from the mythology of pop culture, you know? Uh, 
And the flawed Superman and political heroes and villains that I paint are now a metaphor for Sikh society and my own psychological illness. Like this, I have a parallel narrative running through a lot of my work. Uh, surviving the trauma of racism and a psychotic break and a horrific family tragedy, I was hospitalized in a state of asylum for 20 years. But uh, I look at that as a mixed blessing. Uh, in that, though I was locked up indefinitely, I had the benefit of a dynamic art rehab program, Fremont Psychiatric Center's Living Museum. And there I painted every day, uh, building a body of work. Uh, I, I recorded a vast catalog of original songs, and once again, I wrote my memoir. And, and uh, I also learned to use my art to gain insight into my illness, uh, understand my trauma, and, and, and eventually to heal. But the greatest blessing of all was meeting the love of my life, Susan, there at the Living Museum. Uh, and some 26 years later, we were living together in an apartment in Jackson Heights. We, She's also an artist, and, and so we collaborate on various art projects. Uh, we support each other and have meaningful conversations into the night about art, culture, and life. And uh, having someone in my life who's, who's an artist, as, as well as I am, and also a sufferer of mental illness, uh, so that we can understand each other, what we're going through, good and bad, and have empathy toward each other. I really feel like I'm probably the luckiest and happiest man I know. So here's Susan to tell you a little bit about herself. I love you too. Um, hi, my name is Susan. I'm an untrained self-taught artist. I started creating at a young age. I also started self-harming at a young age. Um, I didn't talk or communicate that well for much of my life. And that really left art as my language and my refuge, my safe space, and a tool for healing before I was aware of it. I came from a dysfunctional family with a lot of abuse and a suicide attempt led to a diagnosis of mental illness when I was a teenager and hospitalizations. I use art to cope with the symptoms of my trauma and mental illness. I usually work when I'm in a dark mood or I'm having a lot of anxiety. And uh, some of the mediums I like to use are text and writing, um, house paint because it's cheap and affordable. And I love the way it flows and it covers a lot of area. Um, I like to paint on the floor. Um, I also like sewing. And uh, when I was young, my mother wouldn't let me sew or create. And so now as an adult, I can sew whatever I want and I get to take that power back from her. Um, like Isa, um, I used to love to write in the hospital and I started writing my solo play in the hospital, not knowing that it was gonna turn into that. <laughs> Later on when I performed it, I got so much um, feedback and support from my audiences. And that's what really helped me come out and identify as an artist with mental illness for the first time. I soon realized that my story could be anyone's story and the personal leads to the political. So we just have to keep using our voices and telling our stories, right Issa? Yeah, I, I look at it as, as no other choice, really, for me. Uh, my, um, uh, my life is informed by my getting, my development mental illness and having been hospitalized and the trauma and the things I've been through, I, it's informed my life. So I, I think it's wise for me and maybe others to use that, you know, use, use, turn your vulnerability into a strength, you know. Um, otherwise, you're hiding. And you'll always have that high, that, that veneer of what's that person got to hide. You know, that, that sometimes uh, people can see through that anyway. But it's, it's like a necessary wall that you're putting up between yourself and society. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you so much, Kay. Thank you, Lyle, Isa, and Susan for such a wonderful discussion which reminds me, having just watched recently, Julian Schnabel film at Eternity's, Eternity's Gate with Willem Dafoe playing Vincent van Gogh in his very last years. Uh, I would like to remind you a very interesting fact that some of you who have read van Gogh's famous letter to his brother Theo might remember Vincent upon being released in 1890 after having spent a year in an asylum 
as Song Remy de Provence have compelled Theo, his brother, to ask Dr. Gachet, who is now famous among us because his two portrait was painted by Van Gogh, but otherwise known in France at the time as homopathic doctor and founder of group therapy, he was asked to help Vincent with his mental condition. Vincent's first impression of Gachet was unfavorable as he wrote to his brother. I think, I'm paraphrasing, I think that we must not count on Dr. Gachet at all. First of all, he's sicker than I am, or shall we say just as much, I don't think if one man Blind men miss the other blind men. Don't they would fall into the ditch? However, in the letter dated two days later to his sister, Wilhelmina, he shared a different observation altogether by saying, I have found a true friend in Dr. Gachet, something like another brother. So much do we resemble each other physically and also mentally. My point for those of us who have read also in college, Michel Foucault, 1964 classics book, Madness and Civilization. We do remember the very fact that when the shame are writing about the insane, they aren't just describing what it meant to be insane. They are defining just what it means to be normal by contrasting that with insanity. This is because insanity and, and insanity are socially constructed categories. People identify being normal and define that through their description of the abnormal. That's the reductive view which we don't subscribe to that easily. For none of us would ever look at Vincent van Gogh's painting, any painting of his really, and feel pity for the painter. We feel instead the vitality of life's energy and compassion that radiate from the painting our work onto our skin, into our bodies, to our whole being, really. We are grateful, therefore, to Vincent van Gogh, to artists like him, like those at Fountain House, who essentially have different accesses to reality than we do. That's my very thought for the moment. Are there any final thoughts you would like to share with our audience? Kay, Lyle, Isa, and Susan? Yeah, I have a question for Kay. And in, in, in the reading that I've done uh, of your work, in, in, all, in the time that you've spent working on, you know, problems of, of creativity and, and, and mental illness, can you kind of give me an overview about how you think the, uh, sort of creativity fits into basically our, our mental makeup as, as human beings? And, you know, do we all have a kind of you know, a kind of creativity that might be lurking there. Just trying to get a sort of larger view of this from, from you. Well, I think that certainly creativity is probably not unique to humans. Uh, there are all sorts of animals that go out and explore and put things together in different sorts of ways. But um, it's, it's obviously most strongly associated with humans. And I think it's uh, just incredibly important to our survival. I mean, I, there's no way that we could have done what we've done over the, uh, the millennia without having been able to c come up with new ways of, of approaching things. But what's interesting is how far back it goes in terms of art is that, you know, it's one thing to invent your way off an island uh, where it's highly practical, makes sense and so forth. But, but why art? And I, I've just been writing something for a book and it was looking at the Neanderthal literature and these, you know, these right. ancient, um, ancient, ancient, 180,000 years old uh, uh, paintings and uh, structures that were put together that were clearly art. I mean, no, quote, practical value. Uh, and what is that? And what does that give to people, you know? And, and how extraordinary it, it really is. And, and I think it's something that I, I don't take the point of view that everybody's creative and you know you just have to bring out the creativity. I think that sounds good. I think it makes teachers feel good. Uh, I think it makes parents makes them feel good, but I don't think there's a whole lot of evidence. That obviously everybody's creative to a point, but there's just so obviously some people who are just unbelievably innovative and have, and have gone through, as you all were talking about, you know, in terms of uh, a lot of adversity and a lot of abuse and so forth. And somehow you came out 
creating. Uh, and that's, that's an extraordinary thing. It's a very deeply human and wonderful thing. Yeah. And it, it's helped us. It, it, as we create, it helps us heal. You know, I, I found looking back on a lot of paintings that I've done six months later, a year later, and saying, ah, I, I see what I was going through there. And I, and I helps you understand. It's like self-therapizing on yourself a little bit, you know, and so... It, it, it's, it's healing. It's, it's, I couldn't have healed without it. Yeah. The, the other insight I, I I've had, and it's, it's not obviously not unique to me. Uh, and that is this idea that, you know, for, for years, for decades, for, for, for a century, at least, there's been a, a kind of notion that insiders and outsiders are somehow, they're different, that art world people have their own set of issues that, Artists inside the art world do one thing and artists outside the art world, they do something else. And that's been used as a stick to beat, you know, insider artists for a long time. It's like the only real art comes from people who are outside the system. Uh, mm. And likewise, the, you know, mm. the, the comment that, you know, people outside the system are really not making art at all. They're doing something else. But what's really fascinating to me is that the, the, the more carefully I look at all this work and indeed, the more attention we pay with the assumption that the work that we're looking at is some form of meaningful formal communication, the more we realize that the distinctions between insiders and outsiders are really difficult to maintain. When what we're really seeing is a kind of a merging of two worlds and that, that actually the, the, the barriers between them are in many ways, there are obviously cultural constructed, but they're, but they're also they're deeply misleading. Uh, and that's been really interesting to see. It's, it's no accident that so many contemporary artists are looking at, at so-called outsiders, not as a way to, to, in a sense, to trash the art world, but they're looking for inspiration. They're looking for people who share techniques, commitments, uh, formal, prop, you know, formal uh, awareness. All those things, are, are, they are being shared. And that's, to me, that's a, a very interesting moment. Uh, in the way we're looking at, at contemporary art, for sure. Right, right. I agree with you. It's kind of like how Picasso was looking to African art to then develop Cubism. And I think that's kind of what we're on the precipice of right now. And I think the outside art will merge with the contemporary, or if it hasn't already. And we're going to see an explosion of something else that is contemporary and very, very indebted to the outside. Yeah.